بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رمضان مبارك for all the people that are online uh, we have some of the students here the international students in particular that got, that got um, stuck in the United States there so we're happy to have them but uh, inshallah may Allah make it easy open it up for everybody and uh, remove this blight that's on us the the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, in a hadith, he said, "Ma fasha." Uh, he said, "Ma ma 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 zaharat al fahisha tu fi qawmin ila fasha fihim al taqoon, wal aujaa al lati lam takun fi aslafihim." So you get new diseases from human disobedience. I mean, people don't make these connections, but that hadith is a sound hadith. Um, but he also said in a riwayah in Imam Ahmad's Musnad that. Um, that Allah removes these tribulations um, when, when thuraya, a najm, he called it a najm, but the ulama says thuraya is on, um, is on the manzila of thuraya. So it's the actual mansion, what they call a mansion in classical ancient astronomy. Um, that he said Allah removes those things. So that's May 17th. And Ibn Hajar says that it's hukum al adi, it's an empirical judgment. Like he's not saying that, that it has to happen, but that would be the norm that uh, like influenza season, things like that, they, they're removed around that time when the Najm is on the horizon. So inshallah, may Allah make that haqqiqhu um, lana. We're, we're looking at uh, Ibn Juzayd Kalbi, great Andalusian uh, martyr and scholar, who's, who's been one of my favorite scholars for many years. Um, I, I've, uh, I've, um, I've always gone to the Tasil Ulum al as a as a kind of first commentary just to see what he says. And I'm always amazed at how much, despite the fact that it's really only two volumes, how much um, he puts in, how much meaning. And he, he actually has a really um, just comprehensive uh, approach because he brings in rhetoric, he brings in uh, fiqh, he brings in aqidah. He brings in all these different things. And he's written two really beautiful books. One is the Quranic Tasawwuf, showing Tasawwuf only from the Quran. And then another book he did on Aqidah, which is uh, purely Quran from just using the Quran as a foundation for it. So he was steeped uh, in, in, in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, he, he makes an argument that the, he's looking at the maqasid of the Qur'an, and so he told us, to, just to reiterate, that the, the, the fundamental maqasid of the Qur'an is that it's an invitation. It's like you get an invitation and it's RSVP. You, you have to respond and, 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 and let them know that you're coming. And so the Book of Allah is an invitation, and all revelations are invitations. The difference between the Qur'an and the previous dispensations is that the Quranic revelation uh, is to all peoples. So uh, it's kafa, you know, it's a nas kafa, it's all peoples, whereas the previous dispensations were to specific peoples. And um, I mean, Christianity is an interesting, both Christianity and Buddhism are the other two great proselytizing traditions in the world. Uh, if you look at Hinduism, it's, it's, it's it's really, even though there are people that convert to Hinduism, it's essentially a, uh, an ethnic tradition. Judaism is essentially an ethnic tradition. I mean, they do have the Noahidic laws that they um, invite people to. And, and uh, interestingly enough, um, Kohler in his book on Jewish theology actually says that the traditional rabbis understood Islam to be a divine s force, it, that it was from God because the, the Prophet Sallallahu was teaching the essential Noahidic laws to the, to the Ajam, to, the, to the, uh, the Ummiyin, to the Gentile people. And I think the Ummiyun is, a, is, a, is probably closer to Gentile uh, because he's Nabi al-Ummiyin. And in the, in the books of uh, Aqidah, they mention that you know, if, if the Jews say that he's Nabi al-Ummiyin, like he's the Gentile prophet, that it's not enough. They have to accept him. And there are Jews that accept that. Like I know a rabbi who says, I believe the prophet Muhammad is a true prophet from God, but Moses is my prophet. 
And so that's what those, why those books say that, because there were rabbis that acknowledged that. So uh, we looked at the, uh, the, these seven. He looks at seven um, aspects to the Quran, to looking at the Quran. And, and the first is obviously the rububiyah. And I'll just say one thing about rububiyah. This should not be uh, understood to be this, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the approach to theology in which you, have, you separate between types of tawheed. Um, that was a, a later uh, innovation that um, you know, some of the, the Hanbali scholars introduced into um, Kalam. But traditionally, Tawheed was not seen as like Uluhiya, Rububiya, and Asma wa Sifat. Some have added even Hakamiya and added others. Tawheed is Tawheed. And, and the proof that, because in that argument of Uluhiya and Rububiya, the proof that, um, that the um, that the, uh, everybody has Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, but they don't have Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, is that the question in the grave is not man ilahuka, it's man rabbuka, it's who's your Lord. And that's something that uh, Imam al-Qudai uh, brought out, that if it was Uluhiyyah, it would say man ilahuka, if everybody accepts Allah as Rabbul Alameen. Um, so here he means Rububiyyah teaching us about God through creation, through his marbul, because that, th that's the way we know it. I mentioned earlier that alam is the word for world, which is the, it's called in Arabic, um, the, the instrumental, the noun of instrument. So it's, it's, it's ismul ala, khatam, the seal. And so, uh, and then he went into the nabuwa, and we looked at the 25 prophets that are mentioned in the Quran, and then the, the argument, we can't specify a number. Some of the books of Aqidah later mention uh, 124,000. Some, some mention uh, other numbers. But there's no, we don't know. Allahu alam. Allah knows. But every people's received messages from God. And then, and then, so then the ma'ad, which is the afterlife, where we return to. And now he's looking at al-ahkam. And this is the tafsil. So in the ahkam, you have basically commands and prohibitions. And, and taqwa, if you look at the very first uh, command in the Quran, which is in Surah Al-Baqarah, linearly, I mean, the first command in Revelation is iqra, but linearly, if you look at how the Quran uh, is laid out, uh, the very first command is, uh, is, is to attaqwa rabbukum, you know, to, to have taqwa, to guard yourself, to protect yourself, um, and to be dutifully aware of God, to be, to be pious, to be dutiful. And that means fulfilling the commandments and prohibitions. So if you look at the commands and the prohibitions, these are called the awamir and nawahi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has awamir and then he has nawahi, things that he tells us to do, things that he doesn't tell us to do. And then like the Prophet sallallahu said that sakata ana shia rahmatan bikum, Right, that he, he was silent about things as a mercy to you. So things that Allah was silent about, فَلَا تَبْحَثُوا عَنْهَا Don't seek them out. Uh, don't, don't, uh, don't, uh, that the people that uh, go too, delve too deeply and become too obsessed with these things can actually go astray. And so uh, the commands and prohibition go under five categories. The first is wajib, and wajib is basically what you're rewarded for doing, and then there's a threat of punishment for not doing it. Allah can forgive people, but there's a threat of punishment for not doing it. And then the mandub, which is also, there are different words for it. Um, this is the word the usuli use for it. The sunnah is part of the mandub. The nafila is part of the mandub. And there's, there's, just as there's gradations of obligation, there's also gradations of recommendation. And, and then you have the, the, uh, the mubah, which is a neutral. So the mandub, you're rewarded for doing it, you're not punished for not doing it. And then uh, the mubah is what is permissible. And then the makru is what is disliked or discouraged. Um, and then you have gradations. So, and in the Hanafi school, they have a, they use karahiyah. Uh, to, uh, in, in, uh, there, there's actually a type of prohibition of karahiyah. So you, you'll have a, a, a degree of something that's very makru. And then you have even the Usuris introduced another uh, term which is called khilaf al-awla. 
which was used basically for things that you can't really say they're makru, but, but they're better not done. Um, and and, uh, and s examples of that would be um, things like um, uh, aspects of decorum, you know, that, that a society would, would see. I mean, traditionally, for instance, if you didn't wear a hat publicly as a Muslim, if you did not cover your head, uh, in many places, it was considered, according to the fuqaha, to be musqita uh, al-shahada, like it would actually uh, remove your testimonial ability in court because you weren't seen as a, like following the decorum of the society. In other words, you were like a, not a trustworthy person. Um, those things, I mean, obviously now uh, all that's gone out the window, but that, that's how traditional societies were. So like in Arabia, not that long ago when I first went to Arabia, um, if, if, you, if you didn't wear the ghutra, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as like a Saudi citizen, if you did not wear the ghutra as an adult male, it was seen as something that was just n not appropriate. It was like... You, 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 weren't, you weren't following the decorum of the society, so it was frowned upon. Uh, believe it or not, in, my mother told me in the 1930s in San Francisco, she was from a certain socioeconomic class, because she was from a wealthy family, that she told me that if she didn't go out with mesh and, and a hat, uh, that it was seen as just not, not acceptable. I mean, I wanted to write an article um, my grandmother wore a face veil, and she was a Catholic, because I have a picture of her you know, on her Easter, you know, with a complete face veil. So women did wear veils, in, in, and if you look in the, in the, uh, in the in, even in like 100 years ago in England, there's footage where they're pretty much, they look like Muslim women, the way they're dressed, uh, because traditional women, especially in villages and, and things, dressed very appropriately. So if you broke that, it was a break with decorum. It was a breach of the decorum, which was not good. And so, um, so makru is a very interesting area in fiqh because uh, uh, it, it follows very often urf um, as well. But um, uh, there are things that the Prophet ﷺ clearly told us not to do, but they don't have the level of prohibition. And then finally, haram, which uh, is that if, so makru is if you leave it, you get a reward, but if you do it, you're not, there's no threat of punishment. And then finally haram, which is if, 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 you, if you don't leave it, there's a threat of punishment, uh, and if you leave it, you're rewarded. So there's actually more reward. If you look in this uh, categorization, there's more reward than there is threat. It's very interesting, right? So Allah is generous in that way. And then if you look at the ahkam, the, those that relate to our bodies. So we, we, Islam is a physical religion. So there's all these things that relate to our body. So for instance, our prayer is physical. Fasting is physical, right? Because you're depriving your body of, I mean, we're not depriving our minds of, um, of food, right? We're not meditating on not eating. We're actually not eating. And so, it's in the body, and, and, that, and this is why, because we believe that there is a, uh, that the body partakes in, in the ibadah, and, 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 and we believe in the bodily resurrection. I mean, this was a debate amongst the uh, philosophers, but we actually believe in, this is, you know, a, a khalq jadid, it's a new creation, which is this, this body and soul that has become immeshed. And, and, and so this is something really central to the Islamic tradition is that we believe it, that the body is, that, that we, we, we're embodied souls, but there's, there's a complete harmonization of these two things. So we don't have a kind of duality in that way, even though there is a separation of the soul, but there's a reunification with what's called a jasad al-baqi, which is the eternal body that's restored. And it's restored from some kind of, if it's genetic material, we don't know. I mean, cloning, the, uh, the Quran says, <laughs> that Allah will show us our, His signs. And one of the things 
that the Prophet said is there is an indestructible portion of the human body. It's indestructible. And we don't know, is it, you know, what it is. I mean, they, traditionally they said the coccyx is, is the traditional view of it. But, but Allahu alam, I mean, we, we know that there is something, there's a seed in us. And from that, there's a recreation. So now we know theoretically that you can take, you know, it's like a hologram where each cell, you know, in a hologram, if you take a hologram and you take one small portion of the hologram, it's the whole thing. So if you take, um, you know, a portion of the human being, it's, it's the whole thing, because all the genetic material is there. And this is why Allah says in the Quran that he, he created us from min nutfatan amshaj, right? There's a nutfa, which is the zygote. So there, the initial, uh, the coming together of these two things, and then it's amshaj, so it's mixed together. And the, the ulama, if you read the tafsirs, they don't know why the substantive is in the singular, and yet the, the attribute is in the plural. But we know now, and then also in the Quran when it says that, that we will, that, um, that, that Allah created us min, 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 min yen, right, yumna, and then tumna, so there's two qira'a, right? So there's yumna and tumna, because it's a male and a female many, because people forget that the woman has many, and the man has many. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if, because they asked what determines the male or the female, and he said, if the, if, if the, if the male uh, water gets there before the female water gets there, that's X and Y, clearly, right? So, so, you know, and he, and he had knowledge of these things, but how do you express it to a seventh century people uh, that, that would not know any of these things? It's like, you know, when, when I, I saw this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ with Aisha um, he, uh, she asked him when he said the ta'an and the ta'un, that fana'u ummati bi ta'ni wa ta'un, that my ummah will be destroyed by uh, a strike, a, a martial strike, so a, an attack, and then ta'un. So he put them together. So is that a biological weapon? You know, Allahu alam. But it's, he put them together. Bata'ni wa ta'un. So she said, arafna ta'an, we know what a, a, a military strike is. What's, what's, a, what's a ta'un? Because she didn't know. They, they didn't have ta'un in, in Mecca or Medina. So she, she wouldn't have known what ta'un was. So she said, what's ta'un? And he said, وَخْزُنْ مِنْ عَدَائِكُمْ الْجِنْ it's, it's, a, it's a penetration from your unseen enemies. Because jinn is, is anything that لَا يُبْصَرُ in Arabic. Al-jinn is مَا لَا يُبْصَرُ It's what you cannot see. So even Lisan al-Arab says the angels are called jinn in that they're مِنْ عَالَمِ الْجِنْ They're the, from the unseen world. So the jinn are, it's one of these things where it's, uh, you know, إِطَّاقَ الْبَعْضَ عَلَى الْكُلْ Right? So, or itaq al kull ala ba'd, synagdoki they call it. So, yeah. so, so, in that hadith, what's amazing to me is that the wakhzun, wakhaza is what a needle does. So you penetrate, and, and on viruses they call them spikes, viral spikes. So the, the, the virus comes in and penetrates the cell wall, and then it releases it. So what protects us from that? our army, our internal army. So we have an immune system that's, that's got these white blood cells that are reconnoitering throughout uh, to make sure the enemies, right? So if it sees a virus or a bacteria, it, it identifies it as an enemy. And then it goes and it tries, to, and, and if one overwhelms the other, that's how you get sick or healthy by it. So the fact that the Prophet described it as a, it's a penetration of your unseen enemy, in other words, they got through your barriers, like they have penetrated your barriers. So, I mean, that is a miracle to me of, of uh, clearly, of the, of the So anyway, the, um, the body, like prayer and fasting and, and, uh, and hajj is also, we forget, it's a physical journey. Like you, you don't do virtual hajj. You know, it is a physical journey. Now they might be, I don't know. <laughs> Inshallah, people get restored. But it's a physical journey where your body is going and, and 
it's it's getting the reward and and um, and then this is why the body is so terrified uh, of disobedience because like what did I do to deserve this because your will is what's willing your body to do things it doesn't want to do and that's why the tongue you know every morning all the whole body says to the tongue lisan al hal you know fina like don't Fear God with us. If you're straight, we're straight. Like, and if you go astray, we go astray. So the, so the, 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 the body is afraid of the tongue. And the tongue, um, as uh, Ralph Nader said, you know, his mother told him to eat the vegetables. And uh, he said, I don't like that when he was a boy. I heard him tell the story. He said, when I was a boy, he said, I don't like vegetables. She said, who is I? And he said, well, me. He said, who's me? He said, well, I don't, what do you mean? She said, you said you don't, you don't like vegetables. I know your liver likes vegetables, your kidneys like vegetables, your lungs like vegetables. Why are you letting your tongue talk on behalf of the whole body? <laughs> so the tongue is a problem. Right, it's very interesting. So the next is those that relate to wealth, such as zakat and, and sadaqa and all those things. So like sadaqa is a burhan, it proves your thing. And sadaqa also is a synonym for zakat. So it's used in the Quran also for zakat. But generally sadaqa means charity and it's from sidq, which is sincerity. So it shows your sincerity. And then those that relate to the matters of the heart. So you have the body, the wealth, and the heart. And, 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 and the ahkam encompass all of these things. So for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns against uh, uh, kibar and warns against uh, treachery and warns against all these things that relate to the heart and then tells us to be truthful. Uh, so sidq is from the heart. So these are all related to the ahkam. And then we get into al-wa'ad, uh, the promises. Uh, the wa'ad is the promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah promises the good of this world, such as being granted victory and prominence, and then promises good in the afterlife, such as being granted paradise. So the wa'ad is that if you follow these rules, if you obey Allah, if you're people of taqwa, Allah will give you tamkeen, He'll give you victory in tamsurullah yansurkum, He'll give you victory in this world. And if you deviate from them, let them be forewarned. If they go against your, your way, you are, will be afflicted with calamities, with civil strife. The Prophet ﷺ said that, uh, you know, that people will not betray this covenant, a, a covenant of a prophet, except they will have enemies that will take over them. Right? So these are, these are what you have to understand about the Quran is the Quran is a book of metaphysics. You know, you have physical laws, like Newton described all these laws. Um, you have laws of entropy. You have, uh, you know, a law of cause and effect. Um, and, and, and those physical laws work in the world. So if, 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 you know, if you take a knife and you cut, there's a physical law that something's gonna happen when you do that if you cut flesh. Um, Metaphysical laws are, are beyond the physical realm. They're working at another level. And, and if, you, if you don't understand those laws, uh, you will do the same type of harm that can happen to you with not understanding physical laws. Like if you don't know that jumping out of an airplane is dangerous, right, without a parachute, and even with a parachute it could be dangerous. But if you don't know that, and you jump out or jump off a building, right? Like there's a whole TV series, I think, of people jumping off because they're so stupid. And then, so they called that like jackass because they're acknowledging how stupid it is. But there are people like that that don't realize that you can really hurt yourself. And so they do things that are very harmful. The same is true, this is, we're forewarned. This is the thing about the prophets. They have forewarned us about all of these things. And so that's the wa'ad, uh, is, is the divine promise. And then you have the wa'id. So it's the same, same words. 
uh, root, wa'da, to promise, and wa'id is a threat, o'ada. Oh, so engenders fear of punishment in this world, right? But also engenders fear of punishment in the afterlife. So both are problematic. If you disobey these laws that Allah has set down, you're going to have, you're lucky if we get them in this world. There, it's better to get the effects of it. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna ummati ummatun marhuma. My ummah has the rahmah of Allah because its punishment is in this world. And so when you look at the Muslim world and see all the horrible things that are happening, you have to understand that you have to see the, the rahmah in, in a lot of it because it is a result of, this is a place of purification. So if you're not gonna do your purification here, if you're not gonna consciously do it, Allah, if he loves you, will do it for you. And through a lot of suffering and through a lot of pain and tribulation. And that's why I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, that Ibn Atayla says, مَنْ لَمْ يُقْبِلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِمُلَاطَفَةِ الْإِحْسَانِ قِيدَ إِلَيْهِ بِسَرَاسِ الْإِمْتِحَانِ and it's an amazing uh, hikmah. You know, if you don't, whoever does not go to Allah as a result of all of the ihsan, of all of the charity, of all of the providential care that God has shown you, if that doesn't drive you to God, then God will drive you to him through tribulations. This is a tragedy of human beings. And so, uh, so just a few minutes because I'm getting a thing, and I just want to get to this one and then, because this one gets very, for me, this is what I, I want to focus on a lot later on, but the qasas are very important. And I'm just going to show you one little thing about the qasas here. The stories of the earlier prophets and other people, such as the companions of the cave and Dhul-Qarnayn, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he, if, if he is told in, 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 uh, in the Quran, these stories were to help him deal with his tribulations. Like, don't worry, what's happening to you happened to the people I loved before you. So don't see this as, as uh, that I'm displeased with you. It's the opposite, that you're of my chosen messengers. And, and just as difficulties happened to Moses and Abraham, Abraham was thrown into a fire. These things are going to happen to you. So if, if you look like in, in, in uh, so the wisdom behind the recurrence of the stories is very interesting. That's what I'm going But this is the last thing I'll focus on here. I'll just give you one example. In Surah Al-Qasas, which is a sur the chapter of, of stories, like Tasin, Meem, so we're going to tell you about Musa for people so this is repeated several times in the Quran, this story, because it's such a fundamental story. But if you look here, when, 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 when Moses, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِيهِ فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي Don't be afraid, just throw him into the, to the Nile, right? Here the yum is the Nile. Throw him into the Nile in that reed basket, and don't worry, he's coming back to you. Now look, look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, that, that uh, I mean, even the, the way he uses it, like the time factors in there, like this is going to take some time, but he's going to come back to you. All right. So that's Um Musa. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings him back because uh, So they, the, the, the wet, he wouldn't wet nurse from the nurses like Allah inspired Moses not to take milk. And so the, the lady told him, oh, I can tell you who, the mother, to bring her as a wet nurse to them. So, faradadnahu, right here it's raduhu. Now it's radadnahu, right? We returned him, right, to, 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 Right. 
So in order for you to, to have the coolness of your eye in your child again and to remove that grief from you and to know that the wa'ad of Allah is certain. Now, look how the end, because uh, remember the stories are for the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi as well, but most importantly, they're for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So look, the end of Qasas, like at the end of so at the beginning of Qasas he's telling you I mean it gives you goosebumps he's telling you like I, I sent Moses back to his mother and I did it in order for you to know that Allah fulfills his promises and so I'm telling you now the one who gave you this book like he's going to just same word that Allah used at the beginning of Qasas he uses at the end of Qasas to show you and so that is in order for the Prophet ﷺ to be at ease I mean look at that you know the med lazim there is again the time factor you know it's like there's, this is going to be some time but don't worry this is my promise just as I brought Moses back to his mother, I will bring you back to Umm al qura to your mother, right? To the mother of, of, of the cities. And, and, he, and he did. And, and this is a miracle of the Quran, that this is, you know, who would have thought when he left Mecca on, on, you know, on his camel with Abu Bakr and, and Suraqa with nothing, like nothing. And yet he comes back victorious and, and with his head bowed because he knew this isn't me. Like he didn't come in like victors come in, the conquerors. He came in humbled with his head bowed uh, knowing who brought him back because it was Allah who brought him back uh, to, to. So, you know, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. So we'll stop there. And question and answers. I'm going to do go into these the wisdom behind the recurrence of the stories more. Um, but you know these are the subtleties of Quran that the whole book is filled with these things, and that's why you know the thing about the Quran is because it's 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 from God, and we we believe this, and and there's valid reason to believe it. Like it's not you know this book has has taken the hearts of some of the most brilliant human beings in human history. I mean, you look at people like Avicenna, uh, Imam al-Ghazali, Fakhruddin al-Razi. I mean, these people are in the top 100 most genius people in the world. And, and you know, they, they were completely convinced of the, uh, the revelation because they, it takes a long time to understand. Most of us are muqallidun. You know, we, we grow up in families. We believe it, and it's true. But the people that studied this deeply, they didn't become less convinced of its truth, they became more convinced. And when you see the rhetorical miracle, and this is why balagha is so important. You know, I mean, there's so many subtleties in the Quran. You look at something like, you know, in, in, uh, in Surah Al-Na'am, when Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says, uh, to, uh, قُلْ to the Prophet Ta'ala, وَأَتْلُ مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ أَلَّا تُشِرْكُ بِهِ شَيْئًا Right? So, so Allah says, do not kill your children from poverty, like you're poor. We will provide for them, for you and for them. But in Surah Al-Isra, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تقتلوا أولادكم خشية إملاق One word changes. So here it's خشية إملاق Don't kill your children out of fear of poverty. You're not poor, but you think if we have more kids, they're going to take sustenance and provision from us. So there it says that Allah نحن نرزقهم وإياكم It switches. So when it's poverty, it says we'll provide for you and for them. So don't worry. But when it's fear of them causing you poverty, Allah starts with whom before he starts with kum. And I mean, that's throughout the Quran, you find these subtleties in repetition that show you that 
a human mind could not have worked all of this out. And, and the Quran, because it's, it's, it's kaleidoscopic in, in its view, it's, it has all views at once. And, and, and that's why when we look at it, you know, the, the Persians, I don't know how you say it in Persian, but there, there's, a, there's a proverb that what does the ant know about the pattern of the Persian carpet? So if you look at the carpet, you know, there's a pattern, the ants walking across it. Well, if you could imagine, like, if we could put, like, the, make the Quran a carpet, then we're, we're like that ant. You know, and so we get, you know, we're just going through, it's all red, and then it's all blue, and then it's all, but if you, if you rise above your, your, your insect nature and actually develop your mind and intellect and study the Quran, it begins, you begin to, you'll only see part of it. You'll never see the whole. Only Allah could, could encompass the reality of the book. But you will, you'll get openings. Even common people that read the Quran constantly, Allah will give them openings and they'll see things and then they'll see relationships and then they'll like, they'll have a verse that comes to them right when they need it. Do you know? I mean, that happens to people, just average people. And then the idea that you can recite the Quran constantly, uh, what is that? Like people, people really, there's, in fact, the ulama say, does it, does it take away from the reward of the recitation when you get an intense ladha in the, because some people they really get ladha from reading the Quran and, the, and they read it constantly um, so the, these are these are things for us to ponder wow mashallah thank you for that one we have received um, a, a consistent, a particularly consistent question, um, and that is, what is your advice on memorizing the Quran? Should one learn Arabic first beforehand? The, um, it depends on what age you're at. So it's much better to memorize it when you're young, especially before puberty because the, the capacity for memorization is just very, very strong at that time. So uh, as you get older, it gets more difficult. Um, and, you know, when I, when I because I can't, became Muslim, I was already an adult. And uh, the people that I study with, the Mauritanians, they say, you know, memorization of the Quran is mandub, but fiqh is wajib, aqidah is wajib. And so they prioritize um, fiqh and aqidah over uh, memorization. Um, so, you know, I would say that uh, learning uh, Arabic to learn the deen is very important. Personally, if I had to choose, I would much rather understand the Quran than, mem than mem a lot of people memorize it and don't understand it. Whereas, alhamdulillah, if you understand it, it's a great blessing to understand it. Um, it's a great blessing to memorize it, undeniably. But if you had to choose, Marab al one of the very first things that he told me uh, when I went to, when I was in Tuaymarat, he said uh, about Hivl, he said, Hivlu uh, Satrain, Khairu Min, no, yeah, he said, Hivlu uh, Satrain, Khairu Min Qiraati Wa Qarain. Like to learn two lines is better than to memorize. Uh, to memorize two lines is better than to reading two camel loads. And then he said, But to understand two lines is better than to memorize two camel loads of knowledge. So understanding is over memorization. And one of the things that the Prophet said about the earlier people, he said, Antum fi zaman qalirun qurra'ahu kathirun fuqaha'ahu so, so that hadith, I think, is very sound in terms of, like he said that, that at that time there weren't a lot of people that memorized it, 
but they, they knew the ahkam, they were fuqaha, they understood it. He said, the time will come in my ummah, you'll have a lot of people that memorize it, but they don't understand it, which w w is a negative thing. It's not that the memorizing it is a negative thing, but memorizing it without understanding then. So I, I would encourage people with their children, you know, if they can, if, if they can find a good qari, you have to be very, very careful, unfortunately now, um, because there's, there's a lot of abuse um, in, in uh, you know, so you have to find trustworthy people. And then you should also always, nobody should be alone with children, especially males that are not mahram. Um, you should never have like one-on-one -on -one with a child. It doesn't matter who they are. And that, that's the sunnah. Uh, Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu, did not allow beardless youth to come into his majlis. And they asked him about it. He said, this is what I saw from my teachers. So you might not have that problem, but just the, you know. So it's very important. Because unfortunately, the Prophet said, one of the signs of the latter days is pedophilia. And that's in the hadith. The Prophet said, yushtahal ghulam. He said, people will desire uh, boys, you know, children. Anyway, alhamdulillah. Barakallahu fikum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.